Welcome back to Sunday afternoon service. What's it been? September 13th? I'm trying to think on the 20th. No, the 20th I preached the morning and then went home. I was sick. So it's been since September 13th, almost a month. Since we had Sunday afternoon service, so it's about time, amen. About time you guys showed up. I'm wondering where you were this whole time. Boy, I tell you, sitting and laying in bed, sick with this Chinese virus on a Sunday just was bothering me bad. Man, I wanted out of that bed. I wanted to get well. I wanted to get back in church. And uh, didn't know it was going to be so hard to do it. But his grace is sufficient. Amen. Genesis, if you, if you don't remember where we left off, Genesis chapter 10. Um, I talked a little bit. Let me back up a little bit. And I was talking about Noah's curse to Canaan. Not, it's, and it's interesting to me that he, that he didn't curse Shem or Ham. Ham was the one, we're going to read this in Genesis 9, Ham was the one who basically walked in on his father. His father was drunk in his tent, Noah, and laying there naked, and Ham went in and saw his father's nakedness. And he went, hmm, Shem and Japheth, knew what Ham had done, and they knew it was wrong. Let's read that very quickly. Genesis chapter 9, verse 18. And the sons of Noah that went forth of the ark were Shem and Ham and Japheth, and Ham is the father of Canaan. And I would, I'm assuming that when Ham did this, that Canaan was already born. I'm, a, I'm making that assumption. I may be wrong. But it says that Ham is the father of Canaan. And these are the three sons of Noah. And let me just stop right here. There is a pattern. I love looking for patterns in the Bible. That's one of my favorite things to do. When I see word phrases or phrases numerically linked to a certain number in the Bible, or I count lists in the Bible. And um, I've noticed that Anytime you have three things, two of them are blessed and one of them is cursed. And I want you to think about it. Paul said that we consist of three things. What are they? Spirit, soul, body. To those who are saved... What happens to our body? It's cursed. It goes to the grave. The spirit and the soul, we're going to get a new body one of these days. Amen? With no COVID. Amen. So we're going to get one of those. So think about that. Think about Calvary. How many crosses at Calvary? How many were blessed at Calvary and how many were cursed? Two and one. Christ and the thief who said, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. This day thou shalt be with me in paradise. The other thief mocked Jesus and cursed him. He was cursed. He went down. Jesus and the other thief go up. Amen. Same way here. The three sons of Noah. Two of them blessed. One of them cursed. So, verse 19, these are the three sons of Noah, and of them was the whole earth overspread. And Noah began to be an husbandman, and he planted a vineyard, and he drank of the wine, and was drunken, and was uncovered within his tent. Was Noah a sinner? Yes. Noah was a sinner. The Bible lays that out very clearly. But Noah, remember what Noah did. Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. And so, um, verse 22, And Ham, the father of Canaan, 
He's making a point here. Canaan is going to be cursed. Saw the nakedness of his father and told his brethren without. And Shem and Japheth took a garment, laid it upon both their shoulders, and went backward and covered the nakedness of their father. And their faces were backward, and they saw not their father's nakedness. And Noah awoke from his wine and knew what his younger son had done unto him. And he said, Cursed be Canaan. To me, it's just interesting. I don't have an answer as to why Noah cursed Ham's son, but that's what he did. He cursed Canaan. Canaan, as you know, would be the father of the Canaanites, and the Canaanites are the people that God expelled out of the land to put Israel in that place. So Canaan represents, get this now, the angels of heaven are divided. Two-thirds of the angels are with God. One-third is not. Isn't that interesting? And what direction do they go? Down. So Canaan represents that principalities and powers and rulers of the darkness of this world and spiritual wickedness in high places. That's what Canaan represents. Okay? Uh, and verse 25, And he said, Cursed be Canaan, a servant of servant, shall he be unto his brethren. And he said, Blessed be the Lord God of Shem, and Canaan shall be his servant. God shall enlarge Japheth, and he shall dwell in the tents of Shem, and Canaan shall be his servant. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Remember to pray for uh, the people still recovering. Pray for Brother Sterling. Pray for Courtney and Todd and their family uh, recovering from the COVID virus. All of us who had it are still in some ways recovering. Uh, my mom mentioned that she still kind of wobbles a little bit. I do too from time to time. You get that COVID fog and then you only crave certain things, don't want to eat anything else. So it has lingering effects and I know I never want it again. Amen. So let's go to prayer and pray for them and pray for our church and our ministries and that God would continue to bless. Heavenly Father, we love you and we do thank you, Father, for everything you do for us. You are a wonderful, wonderful God. You're a, I love you with all my heart, all my soul. And I thank you, God, for blessing this little church. God, we don't need to be mega church. We don't need to be in the thousands. Father, we just need to remain faithful. And Father, help us with our emotions. Help us, God, with our weaknesses. Help us, Father, even with our sins and our transgressions. Help us, dear God, to live righteous, to sin not. Father, we thank you for repentance. We thank you for godly sorrow that worketh repentance unto salvation. But Father, we would just rather not be servants of sin. So Father, help your people today. Bless them and give them grace. Give them strength. Give them wisdom, Lord, in the days that we live in. Help us to understand from your word the mightiness of your word. Bless that word tonight, we pray in Jesus' name. And all of God's people said... Amen. Um, turn to Leviticus 18. God made it clear in the law that uncovering the nakedness of a family member was like what we said this morning. When God sees an unjust scale, he says that's an abomination. The same way when, when a family member looks upon the nakedness. Now, I know some, and I think I remember a month ago mentioning this, that some want to take this story and add something to it, like Ham did something with his father while he was naked. The scripture doesn't tell us that. It just tells us that he looked upon his father's nakedness. And when I hear people say no, that Ham must have done something, it makes me wonder about that person saying that because 
I never had any desire to see any of my relatives naked. Amen? That's not natural. And God said, it's wrong, it's a sin. Leviticus 18, 6. None of you shall approach to any that is near of kin to him to uncover their nakedness. I am the Lord. Boy, look at what God is saying. He's stamping his authority on this. Verse 7, I have it underlined. The nakedness of thy father, first thing out of his mouth. The nakedness of thy father or the nakedness of thy mother shalt thou not uncover. She is thy mother. Thou shalt not uncover her nakedness. The nakedness of thy father's wife shalt thou not uncover. It is thy father's nakedness. The nakedness of thy sister, the daughter of thy father, or daughter of thy mother, whether she be born at home or born abroad, even their nakedness thou shalt not uncover. The nakedness of thy son's daughter or of thy daughter's daughter, even their nakedness shalt thou not uncover. For theirs is thine own nakedness. There is a principle in the Bible that when God dwells in you, he covers you up. When we go to heaven, we're not going to be running around like children naked. We're going to be clothed with garments white and clean. God covers up. When Adam and Eve sinned, the first thing they realized was their nakedness. The shame of their nakedness. You ever had the naked dream? I'm not going to ask you to raise your hand who's had the naked dream. But you have a dream where you don't have no pants on. And you're walking around. And, you know, the psychologists say, boy, that's something going on in your mind or whatever. Okay? But it's a shame to be naked in front of people. There is a church that refers to itself as the naked church. And when I see that, I think of the church of Laodicea. And Jesus commended them, commanded them to buy of him white raiment that they may be clothed to cover their nakedness. So God's pretty clear on this. Um, let's see here. Where do we leave off here? Let's pick it up in verse 15. Thou shalt not uncover the nakedness of thy daughter-in-law. She is thy son's wife. Thou shalt not uncover her nakedness. Thou shalt not uncover the nakedness of thy brother's wife, it is thy brother's nakedness. Thou shalt not uncover the nakedness of a woman and her daughter, neither shalt thou take her son's daughter or her daughter's daughter to uncover her nakedness, for they are her near kinswoman. It is wickedness. The sin of incest, believe it or not, is probably more prominent in this nation than we want to admit. It is a wicked sin. Neither shalt thou take a wife to her sister to vex her, to uncover her nakedness, besides the other in her lifetime. Also, thou shalt not approach unto a woman to uncover her nakedness, as long as she is put apart for her uncleanness. Moreover, thou shalt not lie carnally with thy neighbor's wife to defile thyself with her. God is laying it out specifically. These are things you shall not do. Being clothed, being covered is a sign of a blessing from God. You look at the life of Saul. King Saul, he went from when uh, Samuel anointed him, he prophesied with the prophets. And it was said, is Saul among the prophets? And Saul started out great. But then as sin entered into his life and rebellion to God's word, you find a story in there where Saul is naked and prophesying. Those two don't go together. They don't belong. God was signaling his abandonment of Saul and his life. God had left Saul, and now Saul is uncovered for everybody to see. The shame of his nakedness doth appear. Uh, Matthew chapter 5, verse 27. You have heard that it was said by them of old time, Thou shalt not commit adultery. But I say unto you, that whosoever looketh on a woman to lust after her hath committed adultery with her already in his heart. Jesus knows our hearts. All through the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, you read where Jesus knew the thoughts of the Pharisees. Jesus knew the thoughts of the people. How did he know that? He's the word of God. He always knows what they're thinking. And he can judge them for that. And, and I want you to 
get this. When you steal something, it involves an act. So let's say that this Kleenex box is John's, because John cries a lot. Okay, and I steal that from him. It involves an act. So does thou shalt not kill. So does thou shalt not commit adultery. So does thou shalt not bear false witness against thy neighbor. It involves an action of something that we perform or do. But thou shalt not covet is all done right here. Where no one can see and no one can know what's going on. And we look at things and we covet them. We want them. We desire them. We lust after them. Whether it's a man, a woman, a house, a motorcycle, a boat, an RV, property, whatever it is, we are a covetous people. Aren't you glad for grace? Somebody say amen. Mark chapter 8, verse 38. Whosoever therefore shall be ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, of him also shall the Son of Man be ashamed when he cometh in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. Jesus declares that our generation and the generation that he was in was an adulterous generation. Even if you don't commit the act, the thought of it is still a sin. And while you may claim, well, I've never committed adultery, I've never killed, I've never stolen anything from anybody, I guarantee you, everybody, including me, has coveted. Amen? Revelation 3, verse 17. This is the Laodicean church. Because thou sayest, I am rich and increased with goods, and have need of nothing, and knowest not that thou art wretched, and miserable, and poor, and blind, and naked. Five things here. Am I right? Wretched, miserable, poor, blind, naked. I counsel thee to buy of me gold, tried in the fire, that thou mayest be rich, and white raiment, that thou mayest be clothed, and that the shame of thy nakedness do not appear. And anoint thine eyes with eye salve that thou mayest see. As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Be zealous therefore and repent. Now, you may not be able to constantly guard your eyes from coveting, from lusting, from looking but you can repent. You can repent. God offers that as a gift to us. That's part of his grace package. The ability to ask God's forgiveness for the sin of uncovering somebody's nakedness in our minds. 1 Corinthians 6, verse 9. Know ye not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God? Be not deceived, neither fornicators nor idolaters. And Paul said that covetousness is idolatry. You idolize what it is that you covet. Um, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor, notice this, and I'm, I still have the liberty in this country to preach this, nor effeminate, nor abusers of themselves with mankind. God says you cannot inherit the kingdom of God. And there are churches that are full of sodomites. The pastor telling them that it's okay to be gay. The pastor did the wedding. Wicked generation. Verse 10, nor thieves, nor covetous. There it is. Nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners shall inherit the kingdom of God. And he means that. This, remember, the three parts, spirit, soul, body. The body still covets. It, the flesh still desires. 
it's cursed. And God is not going to save nor rescue your flesh. Tell him thank you for that. Because I want out of this body bad. One of these days, God's going to do it. Okay, and I'm going to wait on that. Uh, and he said in verse 11, And such were some of you. Well, that answers, there's a preacher on the internet that I don't like. Well, there's multitudes. Stephen Anderson is one of them. Some of you might know that name. That guy gives me the creeps. Now, he says he believes the King James. But his views, number one, on salvation, is totally wrong. He is, he is like, if he goes to somebody's house, knocks on the door, talks to them, and prays the sinner's prayer with them, according to him, they're saved. And no matter what lifestyle they live, they're still saved, they're still going to heaven. That's not what this book says. Then he says that all Sodomites have been turned over, that God hates them, they're never going to heaven ever. But that contradicts what you see here. Such were some of you. Believe it or not, I've counseled with men on the phone I've not seen them face to face, but I've had on at least, I think, two occasions, men that have called me and confessed to me that they have homosexual desires. And I read the scripture to them and told them and warned them, you better get on your face before God and ask God for his mercy on you to take this away from you. And God can unless you live in california or some places where they make it illegal they do they make it illegal to try to change a homosexual it's against the law by the way did you see that oregon voted to legalize all drugs who who would go and build a factory in oregon Everybody there is on drugs. They legalized it, taking away the penalty of taking, selling, using drugs, saying that they just need counseling. These people don't want counseling, they want drugs. Don't ask me to go to Portland. And such were some of you, but you're washed, but you're sanctified. You're justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. Tell God thank you for His grace. Somebody say amen. Now, back to Genesis 10. Back, meanwhile, back at the ranch. This is one of those chapters that you look at it and say, well, I'm going to skip this. Don't. Everything in the Bible has a purpose in it. It's like our DNA. Scientists, for years, couldn't figure out most of our DNA signature and what it did. They didn't, had no idea what... They just said it's junk DNA. It does nothing. But then some scientists came along and said, Hold on a second. Wait a minute. That's not junk DNA. It has a purpose for being there. It has a reason. It does something in the body. Just because we can't figure it out doesn't mean it doesn't do anything. And I don't believe there's any junk words in my Bible. Genesis 10. Now these are the generations of the sons of Noah. Shem, Ham, and Japheth. And I want you to think about this. We have three sons of Noah, and we have three primary races of men. Caucasian, Mongoloid, and Negroid. Three primary races of men. Three sons of Noah. 
And so I believe that the three races stem from the three sons of Noah. And you can tell that you have uh, like cross breeding between races, which there is no condemnation in the Bible about that. Uh, Moses took an African wife, so did Abraham, I believe. There's no condemnation for that, and you can see a mixture. In Africa, you have primarily Negroid. As you move toward Asia, you see a mixture of Asian and African together in India and the, what do they call it, the East Asian nations, the Australian Aborigines, okay, have some possible Caucasian features, some possible Asian features, and so on. Then you get into Asia, and you have all the Asian features, and there's variations between Koreans and Japanese and Chinese, and they all know the difference, okay? They don't think they all look alike, okay? But anyway, three sons, three primary races, and this is where we all came from. So, verse 2, the sons of Japheth, Gomer, and Magog, and Madai, and Javan, and Tubal, and Meshech, and Tiras. And the sons of Gomer, Ashkenaz, and Riphath, and Tagarma, and the sons of Javan, Elisha, and Tarshish, and Kittim, and Dodanim. By these were the isles of the Gentiles divided in their lands, every one after his tongue, after their families, in their nations. Bottom line is, God did divide the races. Now, is that a racist statement? No. It is a uncomfortable truth that we like to be around people of our own kind. You are gathered here in this church because of what reason? The Bible. All of us different backgrounds, all of us different places, but this is what binds us together as a family. And we are comfortable with that family. When you go, have you ever visited another church? Like you go into, out of town, go on vacation, go to somebody else's church, or you visit family and you go to their church, and you go, oh, I don't like this. This is not what we do. This is not how we do it. This is not how we believe. And you feel uncomfortable. I think it's the same way with the races. I do not believe that it is wrong scripturally to mingle the races. There's nothing in the scripture that prohibits it. But there's just something in us that we like to be with our own kind of people. Nothing wrong with that. God divided, don't you think about it. Uh, we're going to read about Peleg here in a minute. Um, let me see if I can... No. Let's start it in verse 6. And the sons of Ham, Cush, Mizraim, and Phut, and Canaan. I want you to notice he has four sons. One, two, three, four. Cush, Mizraim, Phut, Canaan is the fourth. And remember that Noah cursed Canaan. Canaan then is going to be a picture of Daniel's fourth kingdom. The image that Nebuchadnezzar saw, the head of gold, the chest of silver, the legs of brass, the feet of iron, the toes mingled iron and clay together, they shall mingle themselves with the seed of men. I believe that this is a picture. By the way, and I, I'm kind of getting ahead of myself, this is the, the number 10 represents what? Dominion. Dominion. Authority. And I'm going to show you that here in a minute. Um, the first king in the world was Nimrod. Look at your Bible. Uh, verse 8, And Cush begat Nimrod. He began to be a mighty one in the earth, and he was a mighty hunter before the Lord. Wherefore it is said, even as Nimrod, the mighty hunter before the Lord. And the beginning of his kingdom, notice that four cities, Babel, Erech, Akkad, and Kalna, in the land of Shinar. Now, people call that Sumeria now, 
but it's the land of Shinar. Notice that Nimrod has four, he rules over four cities. Nimrod, I believe, is a picture of the Antichrist, the beast. And how many horns does the beast have? He's a 10 point buck. Shoot him, JR. Okay? He's a 10 point buck. He's got 10 horns on his head. Those horn, horns represent the force of authority. When a rhinoceros is coming at you at 50 miles an hour, are you going to move out of his way? If you don't, you're going to move out of his way, no matter what. So that's what those horns represent. They represent the force of authority. Ten represents the number for dominion. And here in the 10th chapter of the Bible, you have the first king in the first kingdom. Imagine that. This Bible's in order, is what I'm telling you. Verse 11. Out of the land went forth Asher and builded Nineveh and the city of Rehoboth and Kela and Resan between Nineveh and Kela, the same as a great city. And Mizraim, Mizraim is Egypt. Mizraim begat Ludim and Anamim and Lehebim and Naphtuhim and Pathrusim and Kasluhim, out of whom came Philistim, the Philistines, and Kaphtorim. Now, I don't have, let's look, let's look here back at Nimrod. I mentioned he's the first king. You have the first kingdom mentioned in Genesis 10. Babel, Erech, Akkad, and Kalna. And then, look in Genesis chapter 10, verse, let's start in verse 21. The sons of Shem. Unto Shem also the father of all children of Eber, the, the brother of Japheth, the elder, even to him were children born. The children of Shem, Elam, and Asher, and Arphaxad, and Lud, and Aram. By the way, the word Semite, or Semitism, anti-Semitism, is a reference to the Jews. If you are an anti-Semite, you have hatred for the people of Shem. That's where the word comes from. And... The Israelites came from the lineage of Shem. They are Shemitic or Semitic people. And verse 24, And Arphaxad begat Selah, and Selah begat Eber. Verse 25, And unto Eber, here's what's interesting, were born two sons. The name of one was Peleg, for in his days was the earth divided. Now my geography teacher back at Festus Elementary School, showed me one day how South America fits perfectly in with Africa. If you push them together, they make a perfect fit. And it looks like, at one point, North and South America were joined together with Europe, Russia, China, Africa, and so on. I believe... The Bible's telling us that if you look in Genesis 11, verse 1, the whole earth was of one language and of one speech. And we're, we're not going to get into that today, but here's what God did. God took the three sons of Noah and he gave them different racial characteristics. And they divided into families. Then, in, when we get into Genesis 11, we find out that God then further divided them by what? Language. If you're talking to somebody who speaks Spanish and doesn't know English, he's speaking to you, you're speaking to him, you, where are you getting? You, you're going to get nothing out of it. You're getting nowhere. So, God then separated all the families by language... Because people are going to, who speak one language, they're going to be with other people who speak their language and so on. And then, in the days of Peleg, I believe somehow, someway, God divided the world. Split everything up. But what's interesting to me is that no matter where you go, you can see the high places. What am I talking about? What was you saying, Gary? 
Huh? The mounds, the mounds and the pyramids. Artificial built temples where they worshipped these false gods everywhere around the world. Russia, China, Australia, South America, North America, Europe, England, no matter where you go, these people either built mounds or pyramids, the high places, and they worshiped, watch this now, spiritual wickedness, where? In high places. Wow. So God, we get into Genesis 11, God divided, he split everybody up. When Columbus came sailing from Spain over to the New World, he didn't find it empty of humans, did he? No, there were millions of people living in North and South America and on those islands. Millions of them. They were already inhabited, already had built cities, towns, already had, had kingdoms there. And the Europeans basically just came in and took over. For whatever reason, I don't know. It wasn't me. I didn't do it. Don't blame me. But that's what they did. They came in and took over. But God had split everybody up, first by family, then by tongue, and then by geography. He divided the world up. And we're going to get into that when we get into Genesis chapter 11. So here's Nimrod. He's the first king, and his kingdom is representation of the fourth kingdom. Now, turn to Exodus 18. This number 10, as I said, represents dominion. And whenever you look at numbers in the Bible, there's always a good representation and a bad one. I'll give you an example. Uh, Revelation 17, you have the words in all capital letters, Mystery, Babylon the Great, the Mother of Harlots, and Abominations of the Earth. That's 13 words. They marched around Jericho 13 times. That number on that side represents harlot love. It's a love that's paid for. It's not true love. Okay? On God's side, you have 12 disciples and Jesus walking around. In the wilderness, you had the 12 tribes with God being with them the whole time. 13. 12 tribes plus God. 12 apostles plus Jesus. 13. The charity chapter is 1 Corinthians 13. The phrase, love of God, is mentioned 13 times in this King James Bible. And God's love is pure love. He's... He loves you without any conditions whatsoever. He sent his only begotten son to die even for Joe Biden. To die for him. Okay? And Donald Trump. So, the same way with the number 10. It represents either cruel dominion, the reign of the beast, or it represents God's dominion in our lives. Now watch this, Exodus 18. When Jesus returns, how long is he going to be on earth? 1,000 years. And that's 10 times 10 times 10. Okay? So look here, Exodus 18, verse 17. Moses' father-in-law said unto him, The thing that thou doest is not good. Moses was the only judge over 600, 700,000 Israelites. He was the only judge. And every petty little thing they were taking to Moses for Moses to judge over them. And Jethro, Moses' father-in-law, said, Moses, this is not good. You can't rule and judge every little thing. You need help. So look at what he told him to do. Verse 18, thou wilt surely wear away both thou and this people that is with thee, for this thing is too heavy for thee. Thou art not able to perform it thyself alone. Hearken now unto my voice. I will give thee counsel, and God shall be with thee. But uh, be thou for the people to God word, that thou mayest bring the causes unto God. And thou shalt teach them ordinances and laws, and shalt shew them the way wherein they must walk, and the work that they must do. 
Moreover, thou shalt provide out of all the people able men such as fear God. And look at these qualifications. Number one, able men. God raises up able men. Ask yourself, am I an able man? And maybe you can ask God, God, I want to be an able man. Uh, number two, where was I? My COVID fog's kicking in. Verse 21, able men, such as fear God, number two. Number three, men of truth. Number four, hating covetousness. They don't cheat in elections. And place... Four things, four conditions, four qualifications. The gospel. Isn't that awesome? Yeah. Able men, fear God, men of truth, hating covetousness. That's the blessing of the gospel. Four qualifications. And anytime you have that number, you're looking at a spiritual significance. Okay? Because when Jesus comes back to reign, is he coming alone? Who's he coming with? Us. Us, you and I. Gary, you ever ridden a horse? I haven't. Who in here has never ridden a horse in your life ever? What? Yeah. One day, we're going to come back ruling with Jesus, riding white horses, dressed in fine linen, white and clean. And we, and I, I love this subject, we are going to help Jesus rule this whole world. I want Alaska. I want it. I want to be, I want to rule over Alaska. Okay? But think about that. We're going to be in a perfect body. This is why that number four is significant. It always refers to the spiritual realm. We're going to come with a new body. Will that new body ever hunger for anything? By the way, I got my mushroom Swiss burger today for lunch. I crave those things. Okay, I, Since COVID. And I don't know if it's a blessing or curse, but I like them. Something else I'll throw in that has happened since I had COVID. I used to get very bad cramps in my feet and calves, especially at night. Some nights I would be up six, seven times. I'd have to stand up and literally walk and try to unlock those muscles that would lock up. During the day, I could feel those muscles twitching, the nerves in there. My doctor, uh, pain management doctor, told me he sees that a lot in people that have been electrocuted. Their nerves get fried, which is why my face and ears get red sometimes because of the heat. And my legs would just twitch all the time. Since COVID, I've not had one cramp, not one. I'm not complaining. But we're going to come back in these perfect bodies. We won't covet things of this world because we've seen heaven. We won't lust after people. We can't be bribed. We have the riches of God's kingdom. Can you bribe a wealthy man? No. He bribes people but you can't bribe him. We can't be bribed. We are not going to be afraid of the puny humans that we're going to judge over. We will judge with perfect righteousness, perfect judgment over this earth for 1,000 years. I believe that. Amen? So look at this. Um, verse 19. Hearken now unto my voice. I will give thee counsel, and God shall be with thee. I already read that. 
So verse 21, Moreover thou shalt provide out of all the people able men, such as fear God, men of truth, hating covetousness, and place such over them to be rulers over, number one, thousands. Thousands is a multiple of ten. And hundred, rulers of hundreds, that's a multiple of ten. Rulers of fifties, that's a multiple of ten. And rulers of tens, that's a multiple of ten. It's ten. In other words, there is a lower court, a higher court, a higher court. How many of them? Thousands, hundreds, fifties, tens. Look at this number. One, two, three, four. Christ's perfect kingdom. Verse 22, and let them judge the people at all seasons. And it shall be that every great matter they shall bring unto thee, but every small matter they shall judge. In other words, the rulers, the judges. So shall it be easier for thyself, and they shall bear the burden with thee. What you're looking at is God instituting a prototype of the millennial reign of Jesus Christ. It's a picture of it. These men were supposed to be chosen by God. They were to fear God. They were to not be afraid of the faces of men. They were not men to be given over to covetousness. I, I'm going to be honest. I don't want Joe Biden in the White House. I think he's corrupt. Amen? I don't think he's qualified. But then I don't like the person who would step in and take his place. She is a communist whore. That's who she is. Bottom line is, in fact, let's, let's go to um, Revelation. Where, where am I wanting to go? Boy, I got a lot here on the number 10. I don't have time to do it. Revelation 20, verse 4. And I saw thrones, and they sat upon them, and judgment was given unto them, plural. And I saw the souls of them that were beheaded for the witness of Jesus and for the word of God, and which had not worshipped the beast, neither his image, neither had received his mark upon their foreheads or in their hands. And they lived and reigned with Christ a thousand years. And by the way, the phrase thousand years is found exactly ten times in your King James Bible. This book is in order. God speaks in order. And just imagine a world where Jesus and his saints rule over the nations in perfect righteousness where every judicial decision is based upon the Word of God. And people then are happy and content to leave it that way. Oh, it's going to be nice. But what has to happen first? You have to bind Satan and put him in prison for a thousand years so he can't destroy it. And then when he's let out, what's the first thing he does? He gathers the nations again. Let's fight one more time because I'm going to try to win. And he's going to be destroyed again. I've read the back of the book. I know how the story ends. Amen? I know who did it. Let's go to prayer. Heavenly Father, we've enjoyed our study time tonight. We thank you, God, that even in what looks like the minutia, the small matters of the Bible, things that we would maybe skip reading. There's profound wisdom in here. Great and mighty things that we know not. Father, I pray, dear God, that just as I'm craving apple juice and Hardy's hamburgers, God, that I would have a craving for knowing more of this book. God, fill my soul with it. Fill my spirit with it. Help me, dear God, to enjoy the study of your word, to meditate on your word, to contemplate, to think on these things. Father, bless your people with your word tonight. 
We love your word. We magnify your word. The word is God. And we thank you for that. Bless your people tonight all around this world. Bless our country, we pray in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen.